From Michigan's number one news station, this is Channel 7's 530 Action News with Bill Bonds, Diana Lewis, and Detroit's First News Team. Good evening, everybody. Without admitting guilt, the Ford Motor Company has agreed to pay $23 million to settle a long-standing discrimination complaint filed by the U.S. government. The Ford Motor Company is downplaying the settlement, while the Equal Opportunity Commission says it's been one of the most significant discrimination cases in American history. Eric Smith has more. The employment discrimination case actually dates back to August 1973. Under terms of the settlement, the Ford Motor Company will shell out $23 million over the next five years to settle the matter. In all, about 13,000 people are affected, but nobody's going to get a fat check overnight. Ford will pay about $8 million to women and minority people who were not hired in the early 1970s, but who may be hired in the future years. Another $3.5 million will go to salaried women and minorities on the job before 1975, and still another $1.5 million to women in hourly jobs who were employed before 1972. Ford Vice President for Labor Relations Peter Pastillo called the settlement fair, but not an admission of any discriminatory practices by Ford. It's clearly stated in the release, both uh, by the agency and ourselves, that there is no admission of guilt required. I think the agency has uh, pressed us to uh, the aggressive hiring patterns we developed. We followed 1978 and 79, and we are going to more actively recruit. But uh, we contended throughout that we uh, bore no guilt and are, are required to make no admission. For its part, the Ford Motor Company agrees to establish a $10 million affirmative action and promotion program for future years. The settlement does not affect any of those people currently on layoffs from Ford, neither does it deal a staggering financial blow to the Ford empire. They put $14 million aside just for this rainy day. At the Ford Rouge Complex in Dearborn, Eric Smith, Channel 7 Action News reporting. Well, it's that time of month when government economists and statisticians tell us what happened to our paychecks, our savings accounts, and our budgets last month. And as you might expect, the news was not good. Here in the Detroit area, food, housing, and transportation costs showed hefty increases in October. As a result, the goods and services the government figures we paid $100 for a year ago now cost us more than $116. And what's even worse, the Labor Department has also reported a drop in the buying power of our dollar. What that means is that, as a general rule, the dollar we spend for anything, that's food, housing, gasoline, clothing, whatever, that dollar is buying just a little bit less than it did in September. Bill? General Motors' multi-million dollar master plan to construct a new assembly plant for a Cadillac on the border of Hamtramck and Detroit is once again under fire tonight. This time, a group of demonstrators picketed outside Detroit's Community and Economic Development Department trying to stop the city from participating with General Motors. Ben Marshall has more. The demonstrators numbered about 25. Some of them we had seen at demonstrations for other causes. But there were others, longtime residents of the area, who are genuinely worried about what will happen to them if they are forced out of their homes. 75-year-old Catherine Patrick has lived there since she was a young woman. 55 years, and in my own home I'm 45. And I'm a widow and 75 years old, and I want my home. I raised all my family there. Six of them went through schools and everything. And my husband lost his job in Packard long, long time ago. But he's dead now. So you want to stay where you are? Oh, yes. That's worth a million dollars to me. Where do you go if uh, ultimately you do have to move? Mount Olive Cemetery. The demonstrators have been seen and heard in this particular demonstration, but the matter will ultimately be decided in the courts. In Detroit, Van Marshall, Channel 7 Action News, reporting. The American automobile companies have built and sold only six million new cars this year. That is certainly not good enough to get them out of the current slump. As a matter of fact, those figures are peanuts compared to the halcyon years that have gone by. Sales figures for the middle of November are in, and here's what they indicate. Overall sales are down 10% from just a year ago. Chrysler K-Car sales have almost doubled from earlier this month, but still they trail the sellout projection and prediction Chrysler made when the line was introduced back in October. Ford's Escort and Lynx did well, but overall Ford sales are down 15% from mid-November of just one year ago. 
General Motors sales are down 8%, Volkswagen is down 23%, and AMC's estimated sales for mid-month are down more than 36% from the same period just 12 months ago. Diana? The death toll from the catastrophic earthquake that shook Italy Sunday has now reached 2,000. Rescue workers say they expect to find more bodies as they continue to search through the rubble. At least 2,000 more people are feared injured. Pope John Paul visited the stricken area near Naples today. He told the people the world has compassion for them. The Pope said he came as their pastor. A vast relief operation is underway tonight with mobile hospitals and tents being set up. Money and supplies are being brought in by truck rail and helicopter. A civil defense official in Naples said despite the contaminated water and the rats, the health situation is now under control. Sunday's quake nearly destroyed 97 towns. Experts say it hit with a force 50 times stronger than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Some of the relief victims and the relief for the victims of the Italian earthquake is being handled in the Detroit area by Mount Clemens Priest. Channel 7's Joe Spencer reports. The office of La Tribuna del Popolo, Detroit's weekly Italian language newspaper, has had many questions since Sunday's earthquake. Some of Detroit's 300,000 Italian Americans have direct ties to the province of Salerno. Aside from fear, people are reacting with pledges of help. Father Dominic Rossi says money is better than clothes. They can help, I mean, um, collecting funds, sending money, because most of all appreciate the money to buy their most need a necessity for life and whatever they need because they lost the house, they lost all their property, they lost everything. So probably they could use money most of all. In 1976, when a major earthquake killed 997 in the northern Friuli region, Detroiters donated more than $45,000. Tonight, many people in Detroit are still waiting to hear about their relatives. Because of the extensive damage, the search for survivors continues and it may be another four or five days before a partial list of the dead is available. La Tribuna del Popolo will publish as many of the names of the dead as they can. From Warren, Joe Spencer, Channel 7 Action News reporting. Anyone wishing to send help to victims of the quake should contact Father Dominic Rossi at the San Francesco Church in Mount Clemens. Bill? There's the people on the West Coast who may need some help in Southern California. Extremely high winds have now pushed brush fires through at least four different counties. At least four people have been killed and the fires are still burning. 10,000 people forced to flee their homes as six separate fires scorched more than 40,000 acres of land east of Los Angeles. More than 300 homes have been destroyed. San Bernardino was the hardest hit area. Fire roaring down out of the foothills, burning through a 10 square block area of that city, gutting more than 100 homes. Both major roads into the mountains from San Bernardino have been shut down to traffic because of those forest fires. Total losses in the latest series of fires estimated at well over $15 million. Firefighters were called to the Marathon Oil Refinery in Detroit today for the second time in approximately a month's time. A fire erupted shortly before noon in the roofing materials that were on top of a crude oil storage tank. The top of the tank was being repaired, and there was some speculation among workers that a welding torch may have triggered the flames. Fire officials indicate to us the blaze was confined to some tar paper and some insulation. The tank did buckle a little bit, but the crude oil inside did not ignite. There was only about three feet of oil in the tank when the fire broke out. Firefighters say there was never any danger of any kind of explosion during this latest blaze at the Marathon area. Diana? And coming up, the search is over and the lawsuits have begun. That story when 7's 530 Action News continues. We've heard a lot about Billy Sins since the first kickoff of the pro football season. Tonight, Dave Diles begins a series on just what Billy is like, both on and off the field. And, of course, Rob will have the weather when 7's Action News continues in just a moment. Undoubtedly, there will be more, but the first lawsuit against the MGM Hotel in Las Vegas was filed today by 18 Mexican nationals who insist that they were guests at the hotel. They filed a $175 million damage suit charging the MGM management maliciously placed the safety of the gambling tables over the safety of human life there. The death toll from the devastating blaze remains officially at 84, the injured list at 700. Every part of the MGM Hotel has been searched at least twice. No more bodies have been found. Reportedly, serious fire code violations have been discovered, though. Firemen say they found holes cut in walls, in stairwells, and in firewalls. The officials say that those openings may have quickened the spread of deadly black smoke. It is reported the holes may have been cut for easy access to heating, air conditioning, and electrical systems in the hotel. Damage to the MGM hotel is already estimated to be in the millions of dollars, but hotel executives are saying tonight that they could reopen for business by next July. 
there will be no official investigation into possible fire hazards at the Pontiac Silver Dome. That decision was reached by a group of state senators in Lansing today following a hearing into the matter. The Senate Administration Rules Committee decided to look into alleged fire code violations at the stadium after hearing reports that the Silver Dome needed additional fire exits. There has also been concern over the placement of propane tanks outside the Silver Dome. After hearing testimony from experts on both sides of the safety issue, the Senate committee was not convinced that an investigation was warranted. Bill? All the activity down in uh, South Bend, Indiana, David, you've been spending almost as much time down there as you have up here. New coach, eh? Probably should get an apartment down there, Bill. Notre I'll go Dame. half with you. <laughs> go half with you. You've got a lot of friends there. Notre Dame introduced its new football coach today, and as Bill said, we did fly to South Bend for the occasion. Jerry Faust is his name, and I ask Father Edmund Joyce why Notre Dame selected Faust. Jerry Faust uh, seemed to have qualities of leadership. He had uh, obvious interest in the young men under his care. The interest went beyond their athletic ability. He wanted to help them succeed as adults, wanted to help educate them. Uh, he was an inspiring kind of leader. He's a man that we felt had uh, great integrity, which is the number one quality we insist upon at Notre Dame. So with all of these various things fitting into place, the only disadvantage would seem to be lack of uh, college coaching experience. And uh, we felt with everything else as positive as it was that uh, the lack of experience probably would be offset by the coaching staff that you have around him. They probably would be uh, men with college experience. And I suspect Jerry will make the transition rather easily. You'll get a much closer look at Jerry Faust with Larry at 6 o'clock. Another coach is out of work, the New Orleans Saints, firing Dick Nolan. After that pitiful effort last night against the Rams, Dick Stanfield, who used to play for the Lions, has been named the interim coach. Nebraska basketball coach Joe Cipriano died of cancer today. He was 49. The champion, Roberto Duran, weighed in at 146. So did former champion Sugar Ray Leonard for their rematch tonight. Leonard is the 6-5 to five favorite to win back the title he lost in June. Billy Sims, who is he? What's he like? How does he think? What about his family? In a three-part series beginning today, John Gross gives you an up-close look at the Lions' hero. With four games to go, Billy Sims has already set the Lions' single-season record for rushing. He's gained 1,118 yards, and he's scored 12 touchdowns. Facts and figures. But what's Billy Sims like out of uniform? Where has he been, and where is he going? We wanted to find out, so we set up an interview at his home in Bloomfield Hill. Uh, basically, I have uh, two sisters and a brother, and my mother still lives in St. Louis and, uh, with my brother, and also my two sisters, they live in Dallas. So it's sort of a rather small family. When Billy was 14, the family moved to Hooks, Texas, which is located about 15 miles west of Texarkana. Population, 3,500. And this is where Billy Sims started his football career. At Hooks High, Billy scored 78 touchdowns, and he gained close to 8,000 yards. Billy was named All-State three times and All-American two times. Off the field, his interest centered around his high school sweetheart, Brenda, who is now Billy's wife. I always be tired after the game because it feels like I've been down there playing a little bit with him. And sometimes it seems like I can feel the hits he get also. From Hooks High, it was on to Oklahoma, and Billy Sims' brilliant career continued. He was named All-American two times, and he won the Heisman Trophy in 1978. Billy Sims was number one in football. But when you ask Billy Sims about priorities in life, football is not number one. Now I think, uh, first I think God is number one in my life, then my wife, then myself come. Because uh, I think without him, I don't think it would be any Billy Sims or whatever. A lot of things he has... Uh, accomplishing life so it starts there what makes you happy just uh, being myself and trying to get people to realize that I'm just like them or anybody else nothing special just treat me as they would treat anybody else coming up tomorrow Billy and Brenda at home and Billy talks about helping the handicapped John Gross Channel 7 sports Billy's super John's not bad either Bill. You know, one of the things interesting about Billy Sims, I'm about 6'1", okay? 
weigh 195 pounds. I take a 42 jacket. He's 5'10 and takes a 46. <laughs> this guy is broad. He's built like you say you are. <laughs> Dave said that. I said that years ago, and he remembered it and stole the line from me. Making plans for a four-day holiday. Rob Kress will help you out by looking at Thanksgiving. Dave may be back at 11 if he behaves. Diana? And we'll have a look at people in the news when we return. Stay with us. 46 jacket. Woo. A governor, a state legislator, and the president-elect. Three political leaders, three people in the news. We start off with some sad news for Connecticut Governor Ella Grasso, who's only one of two women governors in the country. Mrs. Grasso underwent an operation for ovarian cancer last April, and she's been back in the hospital for phlebitis in her left leg. The governor was scheduled to go home this week, but today doctors discovered cancer in her liver. Now they're recommending chemotherapy treatments for Mrs. Grasso. Here in Michigan, State Representative Bobby Krim was re-elected today as Speaker of the House. It's his fourth term in the important post, and the vote was unanimous. Bobby Krim says he knows there are tough times ahead for the state. In fact, he says Michigan's top priority this year is surviving. It turns out that President-elect Ronald Reagan has a family skeleton in his closet, and his brother Neil Reagan is having fun telling everyone about it. Neil is the family historian, and he says the President-elect's grandfather was an Irishman who arrived in the United States by way of Canada in the 1880s. Word is, Grandpa Reagan entered the country without immigration papers, making him an illegal alien. That's people for you. I'm almost afraid to ask about the weather because I can't conceive of it getting much better. Today was... Beautiful. Well, it, it won't get much worse. I was just going to say the weather was <laughs> kind of beautiful. Just very nice. It should hold that way all the way through the holiday coming up Thursday, too. Uh, possibility of a flurry or two on Thursday, but no uh, major snowstorms in here anyway. What we've got is high pressure center that has been moving into the area coming in from the west right here in southern portions of the Nebraska. And it's heading in an easterly direction parked right over Iowa at the present time. And it looks like that will hold the nice weather in here, or at least the clear skies that we have in here at the present time. You can see a little area of cloud cover in Minnesota right now. We're expecting a trough to move down through the Detroit area along about Thanksgiving Day. But that may bring just a little cloud cover with it, a little snow in upstate New York, a little lake effect with winds coming in there, but primarily uh, very pleasant conditions throughout most of the Great Lakes region right now. Temperatures in the 30s and the 40s, a little low pressure center north of Minnesota that will go in a northeasterly direction, so that won't affect us. So what we're looking at is this high pressure center right there in northern Iowa to keep the skies clear tonight and uh, keep the skies clear and nice and sunny tomorrow. Uh, somewhat calm day out there today. Clear skies right now at Metro. 34 degrees, winds out of the northwest at 10 miles an hour, the pressure 30.43 and rising, and the humidity at the present time 44% around the state right now. Uh, generally partly cloudy skies throughout most of Michigan, a little cloud cover again going on in the UP and also some cloud cover up around the thumb area. 31 degrees in Flint, 34 degrees, the current reading in City Airport right now, 34 in Lansing and also up around uh, Saginaw and also 34 degrees over in Muskegon and the western counties. And here's what we're looking for for tonight. A chilly night with a low of 22 deg degrees under clear skies for tomorrow. Mostly sunny and a high of 44 degrees. And then on Thursday, Thanksgiving Day, partly sunny skies and a high of 46 degrees. So really, just about like today. Okay, thank you, Rob. Concerning the release of the American hostages, the Speaker of Iran's Parliament, <coughs> excuse me just a moment, the Speaker of Iran's Parliament could not have made it any plainer, he could not have made it any blunter than he did today. He said, it is up to the Jimmy Carter administration to meet the demands of the government of Iran. That message was delivered to the U.S. today when three representatives of the Algerian government arrived in Washington, D.C. Algeria, of course, is acting as the middleman, the go-between, in the negotiations for the release of those 52 Americans. The possession of Iran appears to leave little room for bargaining, little room for negotiations, but diplomatic experts say the presence of an Algerian banker and the delegation delivering Iran's response may be somewhat encouraging because they say it could mean that some detailed negotiations may occur. The hostages are now in their 388th day of captivity in Iran. Diana? State workers may face six new holidays next year. Holidays they may not want to celebrate. More on that when we come back. The so-called moral majority now has some organized opposition preparing to do battle. We'll have those stories when Sevens Action News continues in just one moment. 
Well, leadership in Lansing trying to come up with ways to save the state of Michigan money in these dire economic times, and thus it is that more than 70,000 state employees may get some extra holidays in their schedules next year, but those holidays perhaps will not be the kind they want to celebrate. State budget officials are working to get authority for the governor to order six one-day furlough days without pay for most state employees. The plan, we are told, would save, save the state of Michigan approximately $18 million a year, and only state employees to be spared the six unpaid holidays would be those people who work in mental institutions or state hospitals where custodial care of the inmates and or the patients are of absolute necessity, as well as, of course, the Michigan State patrol. Diana? Lavonia police tonight are questioning a young man and woman in connection with a crime spree yesterday that left a man dead and his daughter injured. 24-year-old Sandra Baggett and 20-year-old Jerry Anderson, both of Lavonia, are being held without bond. Police say the two will be arraigned tomorrow in the robbery and death of 58-year-old Coleman Seaver. They allegedly beat Mr. Seaver and dumped his body in the trunk of his car before going on to his home a few blocks away. Then police say the two apparently ransacked the house and stabbed Seaver's 21-year-old daughter, Brenda. Brenda Seaver is listed in stable condition tonight in intensive care at Botsford Hospital. Dars Bisco is here now with headlines on what's coming up at 6 o'clock. Dars? Thank you, Diana. 80,000 people jam into it on Sundays, but some people say you may not get out in an emergency. The dispute over the Silver Dome, partially settled in Lansing today, we'll tell you about that. Gold and silver are the hottest things on the black market these days. Tonight, an exclusive interview with a man who makes a living ripping off your valuables. There is no death sentence in our state, but a Michigan man has been sentenced to die. We'll tell you about that as well. And if you have uh, memory or learning problems, we have some answers for you. All of that and more coming up at 6. Bill? Okay. Thank you, Doris. Well, the American Civil Liberties Union is going to use its clout tonight in hopes of neutralizing the so-called political power of the so-called moral majority in this society of ours. The head of the ACLU said today that the rise of the fundamentalist Christian group organization poses what he called a serious threat to the civil liberties that took 200 years to win in America. In an effort to counteract the religious organization, the ACLU has launched a newspaper campaign, and it spells out the changes that the moral majority hopes to bring about. That the Voting Rights Act of 1965 might be repealed. The fact that we get, may get amendments to the Constitution, that we may end the, the woman's right to choose to have an abortion in this country, that we may get school prayer, uh, thrust down the throats of uh, the children, of all the school children in this country, that has shocked people. And people who maybe sat on the sidelines during the last election and watched the moral majority, perhaps with some disdain, are now coming out of the woodwork and want to know what they can do to prevent their program from being enacted into law. So in a sense, it's an ideological war between the moral majority and the ACLU. The leaders of the ACLU also charged that the moral majority is trying to defeat their organization, trying to undermine it. And the president of the moral majority recently called upon his followers all over this country to begin fighting the American Civil Liberties Union. The question is, if both sides pray, which side will God be for? Thanks for joining us. Jack and Dora step in next as Seven's Action News continues at 6. We hope to see you tonight at 11. Thank you for looking in. Hope to see you tonight. Channel 7 Action News continues with Lagoff, Biscoe, Adderley, Hodak, and Detroit's number one news team.